September 3rd, 1943. This week. This week, the war is four years old. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the battle for New Georgia ended in the Central Solomons with the Allies victorious. They were also feeling pretty good from the victory in Sicily the week before, and in the Soviet Union, the advancing Red Army liberated Kharkov and was in fact making gains along much of the front from the center to the Black Sea. We saw that it wasn't just occupying Sicily that was a boost for the Allies. Benito Mussolini was toppled from power as well six weeks ago. Pietro Badoglio's government that was set up after that does not want to continue to fight the war. And on the 3rd, a secret armistice is signed and Italy drops out of the war. Yep, for real. This is not made public though, so they can try to make arrangements to prevent a German takeover. But today on the 3rd, the fourth anniversary of Britain's declaration of war on Germany, Operation Baytown begins. The British 13th Corps, British and Canadian troops, from Bernard Montgomery's 8th Army land at Reggio Calabria. There is little to no resistance and Reggio, Catona, San Giovanni, Melito and Bagnara are all taken this day. The idea for Baytown is to tie down German troops, but Monty has objections to it. He has wanted to prioritize the US 5th Army's Operation Avalanche set to go off next week. His thinking is that the Germans won't think Baytown is the main landing force and they won't bite, and he is correct. Smiling Albert Kesselring and his command think that that will be somewhere further north, like Salerno, so they don't give battle. They withdraw to the north and blow bridges, tunnels, and other infrastructure to delay Monty as much as they can. The Americans might not get moving there until next week, but they are moving this week in the central Solomon Islands, specifically on Vela La Vela. On the 30th, they begin moving on the east coast towards the shore at Cocolope, which they plan to use as a radar station. The coastal track, however, narrows to where the advance must be single file, and even carrying supplies is not really possible. They get some by boat on the 2nd and then continue advancing the rest of this week and next very slowly in in patrol actions and skirmishes. The Allies also want to secure Arundel Island to more effectively isolate the Japanese on Kolumbangara, and they land troops the 27th to do so, but the attack proved again that it was all too easy to underestimate the Japanese capacity for resolute defense. The Americans will have to land a bunch more troops if they really hope to take Arundel. This is also partly because Noboru Sasaki still has not given up his plans for launching his own offensive to retake Munda. In fact, next week, he'll bring in men from Kolumbangara to reinforce. Elsewhere in the Pacific Theater, on the 1st, U.S. forces land on Baker Island and begin building an airstrip. They are going to attack the Gilbert Islands soon enough. Also, on August 31st and September 1st, a couple thousand kilometers to the northwest, U.S. carriers Independence, Essex, and Yorktown attack Marcus Island. This is the new fast carrier task force, but neither side does much damage. Casting my eyes to the Battle of the Atlantic for the month of August, the Allies sink 25 U-boats. 10 U-tankers have been sunk in the past two months, though, and that's big because they support the long-range U-boat activity which is the Germans' main effort these days since the fight in the North Atlantic turned to the Allies' favor. Allied shipping losses are slightly over 100,000 tons. That is far lower than we've seen the past couple of years. They're still taking heavy losses in the Soviet Union, but these days they're also making a lot of gains there. In fact, Konstantin Rokossovsky's Soviet Central Front Offensive that began late last week begins picking up steam this week particularly the 60th Army south of Sevsk, driving faster and faster to the southwest into northern Ukraine, taking Rilsk the 31st, and by today, cutting the Bryansk Konotop Railroad. Rokossovsky transfers all the force he can free up to his left wing, and by now they've reached the Desna on a pretty broad front and opened up an 80-kilometer gap between German Army Group Center and South. This advance, of course, threatens the rear of those enemy units fighting against the right wing of the Voronezh Front, who are also pushing forward, aiming for Romney or Poltava. Troops pushing out from the Kharkov area take Lyubotin the 29th. Further south, units of Rodion Malinovsky's southwest front force the northern Donets. He plans to advance southwest and south, 
But Stavka orders him to transfer a rifle corps, a cavalry corps, and five divisions to the reserves, which weakens his sting a bit. It is the southern front that gets reinforced with 13 rifle divisions and three mobile corps. On the second, though, southwestern front forces take Lysychansk. It is the Third Guard's army specifically that takes Lysychansk, and they push on immediately. By the end of the week, the vanguard has advanced a further 30 kilometers and are now about 55 kilometers northwest of Stalino, the local capital. The southern front is now across the Yelanchik River and some 40 kilometers southeast of Stalino. They have also finally broken the enemy's Mius River positions and taken Taganrug. Something else I'd like to mention about Ukraine this week is the Soviet partisan organization and its coordination with the Red Army. John Erickson writes about it in The Road to Berlin. See, the partisans are actually part of Stavka's operational plans, but they come under the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, not Defense. The central staff of the Soviet partisan movement was set up last year in Moscow. The nominal chief of the Ukrainian staff is Nikita Khrushchev, but the actual chief is Chimofi Strokash. He is deputy commissar of the NKVD in Ukraine. He has attached himself, with 14 officers, to Nikolai Vatutin's Voronezh front staff. He has his top headquarters in Moscow with an operational group in Voroshilovgrad. His main job is building up partisan activity behind the lines in western Ukraine. And by now, all the forces he's gathered there have spent the summer making big raids, mostly against German communications lines. They've taken big losses, as you may imagine, but have by now been reorganized into a guerrilla strike force, which Strokach is mobilizing from Vatutin's headquarters. So the partisans are now operating under the auspices of the Red Army. The plans are for 20 partisan groups totaling like 17,000 men to operate in western Ukraine, sabotaging enemy communications and preventing enemy reserves from going to Kiev, Kremenchug and Dnipropetrovsk. And that enemy is trying to bring in reserves from all over the place. I mentioned last week that OKH acceded to Army Group South Commander Erich von Manstein's request, partially, to evacuate the Axis forces still in the Kuban in the Caucasus. But by the end of August, Adolf Hitler has finally been convinced that 17th Army really is needed elsewhere, and today on the 3rd, he orders the complete evacuation of the Kuban bridgehead. In fact, von Kleist's staff had been quietly working on contingency evacuation plans for some time, and were able to quickly pull together a plan known as Brunhild for a phased withdrawal from the Kuban to be completed within five weeks. For the first time in World War II, the Germans were going to move an entire army by sea. Of course, Soviet North Caucasus Front Commander Ivan Petrov does not know of these plans, but he has ordered the 9th, 18th, and 56 armies to perform local fixing down attacks so the Axis cannot siphon troops off from here to reinforce Army Group South. These attacks by both small units and larger ones up to regimental size begin on the 1st. There is also a lot of fighting up in the northern end of the center this week. Although Andrei Yeremenko's renewed Kalinin Front offensive that began last week Peter's out this week. He has real issues with a lack of ammunition and asks Joseph Stalin for 12 days of rest and refitting and more artillery shells. Stalin says no and orders him to keep up the attack. The armies of the Soviet Western Front have been planning to attack towards Yelnya. The 12th Army Corps opposite them is pretty aware this will likely happen, but they haven't been able to do much to beef up their defenses in the lull of last week. In fact, they're not even really holding prepared positions and don't have the force to make a continuous front line. They've built some emergency trenches, but no bunkers. And while Yelnya is a major supply depot, they only have a flak battalion and some security troops to defend it. Given the tenuous nature of 4th Army's front, the only logical solution was for Hira's group in Mitte to retire behind a major natural obstacle, such as either the Desna River or the Dnieper River. 
On 12th of August, Hitler had authorized the Pantherstellung, intended to be a major line of fortifications stretching from the Baltic to the Black Sea. However, impressive sounding projects such as the Pantherstellung cannot be conjured out of thin air, and construction was not even scheduled to begin until early September. Hitler ordered von Kluge to hold his current positions until the Pantherstellung was ready, which meant for at least another four to six weeks. Consequently, Heinrichi was expected to hold his thinly manned front without hope of further reinforcements. Recipe for disaster. Well, on August 28th at 8 a.m., the Western Front begins an artillery barrage on a 25-kilometer front southeast of Yelnya. At 9.30, the infantry and armor move in. They do not, however, attack along the railway line towards Yelnya, but make their main thrust near Novaya Berezovka, at the joint between 9th Army Corps and Gruppe Harpe. They manage to break a gap between the two formations and advance as much as 8 kilometers over the course of the day. On the 29th, Soviet 10th Guards Army does begin pushing up that railway line, and Army Group Commander Gunther von Kluge sends the Kampfgruppe from the 2nd Panzers to go in and counterattack. But, but against which thrust? The railway one, or the one that split the German forces on the 28th? It actually doesn't matter, because it turns out 2nd Panzer Division has very little combat strength left and can't do much more than be a delaying force. By late afternoon, 9th Army Corps' right flank is collapsing, breakthrough imminent, and the whole German front is beginning a process of disintegration. On the 30th, much of the German forces are in full retreat and the Kampfgruppe withdraws, with but 13 tanks left. Soviet units advance up to 20 kilometers this day, and the 70 Soviet tanks heading up the railway line have good air cover for once. The order goes out to evacuate Yelnya. The Soviets take it by 7 p.m. It is now only 75 kilometers to Smolensk. Further south, Gruppe Harpe is pulling back to Roslavl, short of a route but not too far short. On the first, with Yelnia lost, Dorogo Bush has also been abandoned and is also liberated. The key sector was now the Yelnia Smolensk axis, where the remnants of Schmidt's 9th Army Corps were not able to establish a continuous front. A sudden violent thrust in this direction by Soviet armor could shatter 4th Army's entire front and precipitate a rout. That sounds great but the forward Soviet units are again lacking fuel and ammunition and don't have enough to get their 300 tanks all going for that big offensive blow. This gives Kluge some time to move troops around and throw in what he can. And by the third, the Germans have a tentative front line from east of Yartsevo to west of Yelnya. However, German 4th Army Commander Gotthard Heinrichi knows this is but a temporary respite. His men are furiously digging new defense positions, and further back, the Pantherstellung is being built. But 4th Army has taken 15,000 casualties, its divisions are burnt out, and it won't get real reinforcements until at least January 1944. So who exactly is going to defend those positions? Kluge flies to Hitler's headquarters III to try and figure that out. He is joined by Manstein. And here are two notes to end the week. The German occupation of Denmark is replaced by martial law the 29th. There have been several bombings and strikes there, and the Danish government refuses an ultimatum, so Hermann von Hanneken takes over with the army. That ultimatum is issued by Hitler's representative there, Dr. Werner Best, and it is to stop the strikes and meetings and to impose a curfew, censor the press, and impose the death penalty for sabotage or harboring weapons. The Danish government refuses, the German army then reoccupies Copenhagen, disarms the Danish army, and confines the king to the palace. And on the second, Hitler appoints Albert Speer to be the head of one single authority for industrial production, with personal authority even over the Ministry of Economics, which until now controlled Germany's raw materials. And the fourth year of the war comes to its end, and with it, the first Allied landings on mainland Italy, hopefully for them beginning the process of clearing the continent. The Soviets, for their part, are pushing the Axis back pretty strongly, hopefully for them soon clearing Ukraine and taking Smolensk. You know, the 800,000 soldiers of German Army Group South are outnumbered 
two to one in men and even more in tanks and guns. And Manstein is complaining to Hitler about the neglect of the Eastern Front in favor of Italy. The third British raid of the new Berlin aerial offensive comes also today with just over 300 bombers. Over 130 air crew are lost and 346 people in Berlin are killed, so the Germans are getting hit hard at home and in the east. So what about Italy? Well, as Martin Gilbert writes, as British and Canadian troops came ashore, the Italian government adhered to the terms of the armistice conditions, that no Italian troops will go into action against the invading forces. The armistice itself was signed in Italy that afternoon to come into public and formal effect in five days' time. The German army was now committed to defending a second front on the continent of Europe. And the war enters the first week of its fifth year. And however many more years it takes, I will be there to cover it week by week, or I will as long as the Time Ghost Army is there to finance it, for the army is what keeps this going. Join this adventure at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are our newest commissioned officers, and our army member of the week is Stephanie Schind Schindhelm. Schindhelm. Sorry, Stephanie. Stephanie Schindhelm. So the war enters its fifth year. Five years before it began, Hitler and his crew really turned Germany into Nazi Germany. You can check out how that happened in a Between Two Wars episode right here. Do not forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.